you go to file yeah, yeah, yeah. new patcher yeah. to get here. Okay. So are you gonna send the I'm gonna post it on web courses, the Thank video. You. Yeah. So um, uh, yeah, that's a good point. So does everyone consent to having their questions? If you ask questions or make comments, they're going to be on the video oh, with yeah. the rest of their class will hear. Okay. Only So to make a new object in Max, um, the easiest way is to just remember the keyboard shortcut, which is the letter N. So if you hit the letter N, it'll make a new object. And you'll get this thing, this generic empty object with a one input and an output and a cursor blinking, but it has no idea what this is. And if I type gibberish in here, it's gonna turn orange, and orange means I don't know what that is. I can't do anything with that. There are also buttons in the very top toolbar for different kinds of common objects. So the very first one, it tells you is object. It gives you the keyboard shortcut. And if you click that, it'll just place one in your patch. All right. If I click off the object, I can click and hold and drag to move it around. It's got a bounding box, right? I can change the size of it. If I click it, and hit the delete key, it will go away. So, uh, let me make a metro. So I had a metro. I'm going to make our metro a little bit faster. We'll say 500. So it's going to go every twice a second, right? Every 500 milliseconds. And then one object that we, we kind of used but didn't really use um, was a uh, bang object. Oh, not a bang object. A button object, excuse me. And so the button object I'm going to use just to s visualize what the metro is doing so we can see what it's outputting. And I connect things in Max by clicking and dragging from outputs to inputs. You can also drag from inputs to outputs. So if I click on the output of the Metro and drag over to the input of that button, I get a little cord. And now they're connected. And if I move them around, they're going to stay connected. So nothing's happening. My button isn't getting buttoned. And that's because I actually have to turn the Metro on. Um, let's say I forget how to do that. This is the, the most useful thing I'm going to show you all day, is how to find the help documents. If I right click on an object, the very first thing in the contextual menu is open Metro help. I click and click on that. And it will open a separate patcher that will tell me all about that object. And it will give me some examples. It will have all kinds of stuff that's very useful. So I can see, aha, to turn the metro on and off, I need a toggle. And it also tells me this clever thing here, right? If I send a number into the metro's second input, I can change its speed, right? So if I put 100 in here, it's going to go super fast every 100 milliseconds, so 10 a second. Whereas if I put 1,000 in, it's only once a second. So even though the metro still says 500, the 500 has been overwritten by this inlet. Can I add a condition for that? What do you mean? I mean, if I want the metro to go to 1,000 in case of yes. something before, oh, right. I can do that. Okay. Right. So I might have a message. So a, a message 
is a different type of object. A message is like um, some text or a number, like a variable space that's static. It's not a function. Objects perform functions. Messages are just them. So I could make a message, and I use the letter M oh, okay. to make that, or the second button in the toolbar, message. To yeah. add value. Right. So uh, it's a bit hard to see, but there, there's a visual difference between them. A message has rounded corners and is all gray. An object has hard corners and has a lighter gray bar on the top and bottom. And so I can connect my message to that uh, second input. And now whenever this message receives a bang, it's going to send to there. Right. The other neat thing, if I hover the mouse over inputs or outlets, it will tell me what the object is expecting. Right. So on the metronome, it says metro, set metronome time interval. So it's telling me what data into this that will do, whereas this one, it says metro start stop metronome. Now it doesn't tell me how to do that, but it tells me what it wants, kind of. To know how, I have to open up the metro help, and I see uh, it wants a toggle to turn that on and off. So let me add a toggle, say new toggle, and this object transforms its shape. It's a special kind of object, and I can connect that. And now I've got an on off on my metro. Now, to actually run this, right, to, to, to get it to, to go, I want to click the toggle. I'm clicking the toggle. It doesn't work. It, that's what lets me select it, right, uh, and move it around. So if I want to actually click it, I have to go down here to this lock and lock my patch. So Max has two modes. There's lock mode and edit mode. When the patch is locked, I can interact with objects, and things I click on will respond as they're running. If I'm in edit mode, it will let me move things around and add new objects to the patch. So for instance, now if I try to type n to make a new object, it's not going to do anything. I'm not editing the patch. And you can tell that just by hovering your mouse over stuff, it's not responding the way it did in edit mode. Right, and if I look down here, the lock is now closed. If I hit unlock, everything responds again. Also, you'll see like the toolbars disappear or get grayed out when it's locked because I can't add anything. The shortcut for that is just the letter um, Command E or Control E will lock and unlock. So I've got my metro going. Now I want to be a bit more investigative here and show you a debugging technique that I use constantly. Um, if I want to see what something is doing, right? This is great. This looks nice. But for instance, this metro, right? We know that this, this toggle is starting and stopping it. But I, I don't know exactly why. Like what? is coming out of that toggle to start and stop the metro. Is it a bang? Is it the word start? Is it the word stop? Like what, how is that working? Okay. So I can use a message to figure this out. So the message like this 1000, if I'm running the patch and I hit the 1000, it's going to slow down to once a second because it's replacing that. So I can click on that to send that message um, out of its outlet, right? The message result. The top inlet here is a trigger, right? So if I get a bang on my message in the first inlet, it will send the message out the outlet. The second inlet, though, sets the message. So I can dynamically change my messages or my variables. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect the toggle to this message, and that's going to let us see what the toggle is doing. Nope, because I'm going to set it dynamically. So when I click the toggle off, ah, it's a zero. It set that message. When I turn it on, it overwrites it. It's 
1. So the metro is actually being controlled by the numbers 1 and 0. To prove my point, I'm going to delete the patcher between the metro and the toggle. And I'm going to connect this to there. Now, when I turn this off, the metro should go off. It doesn't. Why? This is a trick of Max and how messages work. Setting messages is different from sending messages. So I've set the message to zero, but I haven't actually sent it. If I click this, it sends the zero, it turns the message off. Okay. Now, I also said that if I get a bang here, uh, it'll trigger this message. So what happens if I connect another patch cord from the toggle to the trigger? So it's going to set the message and then trigger it. Now it turns the metro on, turns the metro off. This, is, this is, will become very important later on when you're trying to figure out what all is actually happening in your patch. Because what I just showed you is not actually intuitive, right? Because looking at this, the way we read, top to bottom, left to right, you would think that the trigger would happen first and then the message would get set. That's not the case. Max works right to left. So first, the message gets reset to one and then it gets triggered. This happens then that happens, always. And in the greater scheme of the patch, this happens, that happens, then this happens, then that happens. It goes left to right, top to bottom. I'm sorry, right to left, right to left. It's backwards. For those of us who read English and other languages that go, you know, left to right. Okay. So that's just the very beginning. This is unnecessary. I'm going to get rid of it. Put that back. Clean this up. Um, I'm going to replace this message with a object called number. And this number object, when the patch is locked, if I click it, that little arrow turns yellow. That means it's active. I can type in a number and hit enter and it will immediately send that number as a message. And again, I can use a message to debug this to make sure it's doing what I think it's doing. There we go. So using the function instead of the message, you don't have to wait for the time to send it. Right, right. It's message. just... Um, it's cleaner. Yeah, it's cleaner. So the number is sending, directly sending the message itself. Um, the other thing I can do is I can click with the mouse on this object and drag to adjust it up and down. I just clicked it. It's an object. In when it's locked. When it's locked. Uh, When it's locked, it's yellow, and when it's not, it's white? When it, the patch is unlocked, it turns gray because I can't uh, uh, change the, the, the number when it's unlocked. OK, so then what did we have in our patch? We had a counter. So I'm going to make counter, new object, counter, and I'm going to say 1 space 8. Now, you will notice the counter has quite a few inputs and outputs. Primarily concerned with the first one, which says int bang are counted and sets the counter value. Aha. So if I give it a bang, it's going to increment the counter. If I give it a number, it's going to jump to that number and then keep counting. So I connect that to my metro. Can't see what's going on. I'm going to make a message. The first one is the current count, okay? 
Let's connect that to our left inlet on the message. And I'm getting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Perfect. That's what I want. Now, Mac Max is very powerful language, right? So it's not it's it's not going to let us just do something simple like counter. It's going to let us have huge control over that counter. So let's see what other information we get from this object, right? Um, the second one is going to let us know when it's at the minimum. The third one lets us know when it hits the maximum. The last one is the carry count, so we can make some more messages oops, just to see what these things are. So, this one does not appear to be doing anything. This one, right, is mostly zero, but then sometimes it's one. When is it one? Yeah, so when it gets to the max of our counter, this one gets a one, otherwise it gets a zero. So it's letting us know if the maximum is hit, right? So I might just use a toggle for that because I know a toggle is an object that deals with zeros and ones. Okay. In this one, 54, 55, what is this doing? Notice it's incrementing. The amount of times that it's hit that hits eight. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so it's counting the number of loops through the counter. That may or may not be useful to us, right? Maybe we want it to do this 10 times, and on the 10th time, we want something else to happen, right? So we could set up a conditional, if this is 10, do something else. Okay. I'm not going to use those. Let's get rid of those. Then, like, looking at the inputs. Okay, so the how second do you, one. How, how do you define the, the one and the eight? I just type them in. So this could be anything. Uh, this could okay. be three, uh, one to okay. three. Now it's only going to count one to three. One, two, three, one, two, three, okay. one, two, three. Okay. Um, and I can also like dynamically change these things. And that's what these other inlets are going to be Trading. for. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right? So, for instance, the first one, the default direction uh, of zero means it's going to count up. If I give it a one, it's going to count down. So it's going to go three, two, one, three, two, one, three, two, one. If I give it two, it's going to go up, down. So it's going to go one, two, three, two, one, two, three, two, one, two, three, two, one, two, three. Right. So I can have the counter work in different ways. Um, the third inlet here resets the counter to the number on the next clock. So I could give this a two, and then the next time the counter gets hit, it jumps to two. Whereas this one immediately resets the counter to two. So if I give that a two and it's off beat, right, from the metro, it immediately goes to two. And this one dynamically changes the maximum, right? So if I give this eight, it'll start counting one to eight again. Okay. That's all well and good. Let me move this back over there. What was the next thing in our patch? The route. Or we, t we talked about select first, right? So I'll do a select, and we had two. We've got our select two. This one's a bit more simple than our counter. It has less inputs and outputs. Connect the first input, right, value to be tested to the counter. And again, just to debug, let's select, put a message down here. And we got a bang. Okay. Now, because of the way select works, the bang never goes away. It might be better for us to use one of these buttons. If I hold down Option while clicking and dragging an object, it'll make a copy of it. That's another way to make objects. So now we see that this button is only lighting up when the select is receiving a 2. right? And so this was the, one of the important things in our patch. Right? Select does not send us a 2. It receives a 2, and it turns it into a bang, right? it converts it. The second outlet here 
Um, this is interesting. Is the output if it's not a two? This is quite odd because it's not actually sending a bang. It's sending the actual number that is not a two. Our other inlet here lets us change what value it's looking for. So if we want to find a five, we could give it a five here and it'll start looking for fives. Right? So I could make a message that says three. If I give it a three, now it's going to match with three. So that's one way to work our counter, right? So we could we could do many selects, right? Select two, select three, select all the different numbers. That's a bit uh, tedious, right? Copying all these objects. Yep. Yeah. So if I select, I can click and drag to select multiple things. Um, if I do Command C and then Command V, there's my copy. Um, I can also select multiple things by holding down Shift and clicking them. Oops, but not patch boards. Okay, so let's look at route. And so route takes values and sends them different ways. So I'm going to say route one, two, three. And again, we've got a ton of inputs and outputs. I might drag this to make it better, bigger. And so our first one, usually the first input, as you may have noticed, is the input I'm most concerned with. Um, this is the number or list to be routed, right? So I'm going to send my number from my counter into the router. And then this is outputs if input matches 1. Outputs if input matches 2. Outputs if input matches 3. What's the last one? When there's not a match. Right, right. So if I send this router for some reason to 5, it's like, I don't know what that is. It's going to send it out. But it's a number and the other one call back. Correct. Correct. You got it. You got it. Yeah. So if um, I'm going to set up a message here and a message here, and we'll see that this is going to give me a bang. Great. And we saw that the bang message is not terribly useful. The button is better for visualizing our bangs. So we can set this up like so. And there we go. Bang, bang, bang. Bang, da, 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 da. I'm going to take this out. And so you might be seeing now the beginnings of a sequencer. Because right? we're taking timed beats and turning them into a sequence. In this case, of pulses of light. We prefer sound, but we're getting there. Are you with me so far? Other things on our router are going to let us um, change what these numbers are. Now, we've been working with numbers so far, right? I might have a string or a variable in here, right? Like cat. So I want to know if the message matches cat. So let's just let's stay with numbers. And you saw that as soon as I did that, let me put cat back. Cat, it adds another output. Right? So this is actually now the cat output. And if I send it the message cat, bang. If I get rid of that as one of my options and send it the message cat again. This is now connected to the, like the dump out, and I get the cat.
then you can use mobile wire in this. Mm -hmm. I can send many things in here, yeah. It's weird. Okay. What yeah. Me first, excuse me. Yeah, yeah. And then how is it in, in adding the changes or what is doing with the changes? As if they were different. For example, they have right. one a one and then the other one are right. minus one right. or something. It's gonna be a zero or it's right. gonna be a one at a minus one. Great question. Right. So if so like I'm sending, I'm constantly sending this one, two, three, and then if I click click cat, I'm sending cat. So how is it dealing with merging those flows of information? Because the Mac Max is constantly running, right? And it's time based, I can I can never actually send two messages at the same time. Okay. They're always gonna be sequence. So it it's it might be one, two, cat three, it might be one, two, three, cat. Uh I can add things together, but I have to use specific objects to do that. For instance, I can make a plus six object. And I'll connect this up to a message so we can see it. And if I run my counter into the plus six object, it's going to add six. To each number. Now, what if I run my counter into both inlets? We can assume the second inlet is going to replace the six, right? So in effect, I'm multiplying by two. I'm adding it to itself. So this is merging two input streams into one. Now, if I send my cat into here, I'm going to get an error because cat is not a number. It doesn't know how to do that. So if I do asterisk, right, now it's going to square my input because it's multiplying it by itself. If I get rid of this, whichever the last one that was there will stay. So it was a three. Was it a three? No. Yeah, it was three. It was three. Okay, but we we want to work with mixed media here. We want to make media systems, so we want this to um, play some music rather than just light up and blink. I'm going to show you several different ways. Um, well, maybe just two ways to work with audio files in Max. It's an audio program, so it's very good at this. Um, There are different ways to work with audio based on how complex you want to be, how simple you want it to be, how um, much control over the audio you want, and how fast you want the performance of the computer to be, right? The simple solution might not be the most efficient one. So conveniently, in this menu over here on the left, there's a music note, and if we click that, it's going to give us um, this library of sounds that Max has. Yours might be slightly different than mine because I've probably added stuff to this library over time. And you've got this slider over here, which is a, an odd kind of click and drag slider that lets you select the duration of the sound. It's like an instant search of the library for audio by length. So if you want things that are one to three seconds, you'd select that part. If you want shorter sounds, select the top part. And you've got a little play button where you can preview them. There's my triangle. Cherokee is a famous Max track. <laughs>
Yeah. So, I'm going to pull out a few um, just short, clicky things for my sequencer here. Um, and if I just click and drag it into my interface and drop it, there it is. If I lock my patch, I can play it with the play button. You can't hear anything because I haven't put uh, an audio output in my patch yet. So let's talk about that for a second. Uh, also, while there, there are several ways to play audio, there are several ways to output audio as well. Um, I'm going to show you the hard way first. I'm go new object, and I want a digital to audio converter, abbreviated DAC, with a tilde. We're going to start seeing tildes on objects. The tilde indicates that it's a, an MSP object using signals. Most of our patch cords, the gray ones, are sending data. They're sending text, or they're sending numbers, or they're sending bangs, which are, we can all think of all those as messages. They exist as like a nugget in time, and they flow through. A signal, right, like an audio signal, is a constant waveform, like a sine wave. It's always sending data of some kind. Um, so it, we work with it in a different kind of way. And the objects that use signals always have a tilde uh, to remind you of that. So I've got my DAC, and I could run my signal channel 1 directly into my DAC, but I don't want to do that because be very loud. So I want to put some way for me to manipulate the volume before I, I go running stuff into this, which is the output for the computer, the speakers. Um, so I'm going to use an object that we just looked at, the um, asterisk. Do you know what the level of the treatment that you have over there is? Ah, so at the, coming from my audio file, it's, it's whatever it is baked in to that file. So it's probably like 100% uh, or 0 dB, right? And then with volume, you're always like reducing the decibel level, right? So you're always subtracting from the... Um, the signal. So I'm going to use a star tilde. Instead of we had a star, there was the asterisk that's like the multiplying symbol. We're going to multiply, but with signals. So we have a tilde. And I'm going to say 0.5. So I'm going to cut my signal in half and connect channel 1 to there, and then connect the output of that to uh, channel 1 on my deck. You'll notice by default, it's giving me stereo sound. This is my left, this is my right. If I want to play both, guess what? There's channel two. You got to do both. Uh, option. Hold down the option key. The only other thing you may have caught that I need, I also need to turn the DAC on and off like I turn the metronome on and off. And it says start one and stop zero. A bit more helpful than the metronome. Um, so I can use a toggle object to do that as well. So I can turn my DAC on. And if I hit play, yes. if I turn the DAC off, can't hear anything. The, the connection to the computer speakers is off. The other thing I can do for the DAC, there's a power button down here in the lower right corner in this volume slider, right? This is the master gain for the whole patch. And this power button doubles the function of putting a toggle on the DAC. So I can also turn the DAC off with this power button. You can have many DACs in your patch, 
if any of them are on, they're all on. If any of them are off, they're all off. Right? So there's this, this unified power controls all the DAX. So for my volume, right, I might like to adjust that. I can create a floating point number, right? So that's if I go to a new message and type float. Oh, why didn't that work? I don't know why that didn't work. I'll have to get back to you on that one. If I just type F, that's the shortcut for my floating point number box. Is it, is it in a message box or not? It is its own kind of thing the way a number is its own kind of thing. It is an object, but it's a special kind of object. Yeah, that's not what we want. Yeah, just use the F key to make one of these. And I'm going to connect it to both uh, write out write inputs of my multipliers, my signal multipliers. So I can have one thing send multiple ways at the same time. And I'm going to be careful with this because I'm going to I can now click and drag my volume. But I don't want to go above one because that's going to damage my speakers. Is there like a limiter thing input? You can have it so it can't be put over one, like an input for that? Yes. What is that object? Ah, I think it's called clip. And I don't remember how this object works, so I'm going to open up the help file. Okay, clip 1050 minimum and the maximum, great. So it, whatever the input is, it's gonna keep it to that range. If I try to give it a 100, it's gonna give me a 50. Beautiful. It's exactly what we were just talking about. So I'm gonna say clip 0 dot 1 dot. The dots are important because they indicate that I want a range of floating values, not a range of integers between 0 and 1 because there are no integers between. I can interject that between my floating point number, like so. And um, I tend to be rather anal about the organization of my patches because these things can get into like spaghetti monster nests very quickly if you don't move around your objects so that they line up nicely. And you'll see it does have a kind of like a auto with those little red lines or alignment marks when you've got it. It snaps a bit into place. Okay, so I said that was the hard way, right? Uh, let me grab another one of these audio files. Let's do something more fun. Yeah, where is charity? Ah, so I can filter. Let's look for. Oh, it must be a short one. Yep, Cherokee. Oh. Cherokee. Right, so it doesn't play because it's not connected to anything. So another way I can work with DAC, um, I can make a new object called Easy DAC. You think that's more or less difficult to use them. <laughs> yeah, easier, right? So this gives me this big speaker icon. It's got two inputs, the same two inputs. It still wants two channels. Um, the only thing that's really easier about this one is that it is its own on-off button. So I can click it to turn it on and off. And you'll see that it's also influencing the master power, right? So I turn it off the master DAC goes off as well. I still want some volume control, but hey, maybe I don't want to deal with this uh, weird multiplying thing. What if I just make, sorry, not a message, a new object called meter tilde. 
and that gives me an audio meter, right? So if I connect my spirit key to that, This is not what I want. Like the difference in one number or what? Yeah. The Sorry, give me a second. I don't want a meter. I want. The game control. Yes, sorry, I want to gain control. Um, so, as you saw just there, right, so in these menus at the top here, as we go across, they get kind of more complex, but there are a bunch of different UI elements, right? So that button is here, there's a toggle here, the shortcut for toggle is T. Um, I've got my numbers, I got my number box, the float box, an audio signal number box. I've got different kinds of sliders and knobs and things I can use. Uh, and in the plus one, I can look specifically for like data objects, image objects, audio objects, which is where I found the game. You could also just type in uh, game control day to get that one. So I put my signal into the gain. I put that into here. I want two of these, one for each channel. Right now. So this is giving me, so that was just my left channel, this will be my right channel. Um, so I can have independent control of them. That can be nice, it can also be a pain. I'd like them just both to be the same you'll notice that the, these gains have actually two outputs. There's this scaled signal output, and there's also, right next to it on the right, is a slider value, so it's gonna give me a numeric value for that slider. I can use that, and if I look at the input on the, there's just one input, but that input will either take the signal to scale or an integer to set the value. So if I connect the integer outlet of one slider to the input of the other, it will now be like a master-slave relationship where changing one changes the other. That does not work the other way, though. So we might say that this is a more intuitive way to work with the audio controls, depending on what you want to do. If you want that fine-grained numeric control, you might want to go with these. It's up to you. Okay. I have very little time left. Um, so I want to show you one other way to put files into your patch. And, and like how do we, we play, I want to play this triangle right with my sequencer. So let's look at that first. If I connect this bang to my playlist, it won't even let me because it knows I do not want a bang. What does it want? Playlist can actually hold multiple files. Um, so it wants the number of the file in the playlist. So I might make a message that says one. When I bang this message, it's gonna give me a one, put that, in there, and now I get my dip, 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 okay? For the sake of brevity, I want another short, sure. I can add or replace tracks in my playlist, like that, by clicking and dragging them. Do, 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 do. Now, you might be like, why? I saw that help file in the playlist. You've been deceiving us this whole time. I could have multiple audio tracks in one playlist. 
if I try to add it to the top, right? Why would I not just run the counter directly into the playlist? You could. If um, you want all these tracks to play in a certain order, right? So let me go back to here. Let me. Um, because I might, for instance, want well for now the second track in that playlist. If I want to play it again, I can use the same track multiple times within my sequencer. The other way to uh, play audio, one of the other ways, is with the SF play tilde object. Um, and I'm just going to copy this over. This one's got uh, channel one. And this says it's going to be giving me a bang when it's done playing the file. If I want two channel audio, I have to tell it so it will give me the second channel, right? So an immediate application of one you might want to use SF Play. If you're doing multi-channel audio surround sound, you want five channels, you got to use SF Play. Playlist won't do it. Um, this takes many different things. Let's open up the help file, take a look. We've got a toggle to play and stop the track. We can do looping. We can pause. We can resume. We can play. Um, certain parts of a file with a seek message. Uh, so we have much more fine-tuned control over the SF play than we do the playlist. In the help files, there are tabs that will show you different uh, particular, like if we're trying to do very specific things, we can adjust the speed of playback of F FS play, um, all kinds of stuff. And so it might show you like different kinds of tricks you can do with the object in those tabs. So real fast. Uh, to give it a file, I need to send it an open object, which will let me choose something off my computer. I can also, and this is preferred, give it a file name. Okay, So it will always play that file. And then the toggle Yes, so that's that's good. Right. Right. That brings me to my, my last point that's very important. If you're gonna use something like this, like I'm gonna type the file name in, or like these playlist objects, I can drag an audio file that's on my computer into here and it will work momentarily for me because it knows my library, right? But if you have dragged audio files into your patch, um and send it to me, the patch won't work because I don't have those audio files, right? So when you go to save this, sorry, uh, I'm gonna say demo seek. Actually, I want you guys to name these things sequence or your name, so I call it sequence or Mosier. I'm gonna make a new folder. I'm also gonna call that file sequence or Mosier. I'm going to save my patch in here. I'm also going to save or copy all the audio files I'm using into that folder. And you're going to submit a zip archive of that folder so that I can run your patch. If your max file is in the same place as your audio files, this file name fit convention will work where you can just type in the file name in SF Play. Your playlist will work. If they're somewhere else, it won't. Next time you open up the patch, it's forgotten where all those things are. Well, 
have this because we just use the default here. So I don't want you to use the default. So, yeah, so let's look at the assignment. What are you going to have to do? Okay, so you've got to make a sound sequencer. You've got to include at least 16 steps, eight unique tracks. You've got to use the metro and counter objects. There should be a toggle to turn the metro on and off. You can optionally use route or select. You can use playlist or SF play or groove. You can look up groove in your own use the help file. And then the considerations, like what's the actual creative part of this, right? Like anyone can write one of those sequencers to play like drum sounds um, or triangle ticks like I did. What, what, what is the musicality of your sequencer? What is its mood? What emotion does it convey, right? Don't make a simple drum machine. What kind of sounds are you going to use? Are they taken from musical instruments? Are they taken from the natural world? Is it, are you going to make a whale synthesizer or sequencer? Are they urban environments? Are they car horns? Are they machines? Um, does your sequencer have precision for different patterns or does it always play the same pattern? How customizable is it, right? Like the clapping music and the drumming ones I showed you had all different kinds of patterns. To get free sounds, freesounds.org, archive.org are great places where you can go download and search for copyright free sound material if you need them. And then I explain that, that zip folder process. One other thing to remember, right, as long as I don't connect one of my route things, what is the function of three then in my sequence? There's no three. No, oh no, there's, there's pause. It's a rest. Yeah, it's a rest. So you don't have, yeah, I want you to have um, 16 steps. Not every step has to be a file, right? Because that, that's what allows for the clapping music thing to happen, right? If it was, the phase wouldn't matter because it's constant noise. But there's just some difference there. <laughs> okay. Any questions about Max? Do you feel okay? When did I save this? I'm sure, yeah. Should I, I you mean, should probably save that. If, yeah. I, if, I, if I have to start the trial and save it, will I? Uh, I don't think so. I think you should let me save it. I'm going to stop the recording.